D. Edward Sturton. He'll think it's a bit grovelly, but it reminded me when he came in and started speaking, it reminded me of when we had Ray Davies, which nobody here will remember because you're all too young. Uh, and I thought, God, uh, uh, it's that voice <laughs> in this shop, Ray Davies of the Kings. So his yeah. voice. <laughs> and um, some of you would have read Confessions. I haven't. And it's. I, I had rather. Keeping him talking about football or <laughs> keeping keeping him on edge. Um, I'm going to we're going to chat for a little while and then I'm sure people will have questions about anything. The amazing war reporting career, belief, Catholicism, all the rest of the it. BBC um, which always comes up. The <laughs> BBC, yeah. Um, I just want to say a quick line from the book because um, to show you, to me, it's very well written. There's a line about Peter Sisson's funeral and who knew that he died. You didn't know, did you? Did you not? Peter well, he's, um, he's a, a Kent. Is he? Yeah. yeah. That lovely face and delivery. And uh, you he's use dead. this line it, about the wake as the tea urns steamed and the verbal of conversation rose pleasantly and I just thought it was wonderful. There was a lots of great atmospheric lines. He was a real hero actually of mine. So I, it was, was he? Yeah. He, he, he was sort of a mentor figure. He was a trainee at ITN and I was a trainee at ITN and he was always incredibly generous in his kind of, you know, advice he'd give to us young ones. Oh, lovely. So, um, yeah, he died very young. I was rather shocked. Yeah. yeah. Um, just because we're in a bookshop, we're, we're like, not hearing Oh, you're not okay. Let me turn like that. Let me turn around. Well, project. Are you all right over there? We will make sure we project. I could go and get the microphone, but it's a lot of fuss. I'll declaim. Because <laughs> um, we're in a bookshop, I always have to ask your comfort book when you were young. You can obviously write. What, what was the book when you were young that got you? Gosh, I think it was the C.S. Lewis, the Narnia books that really got me going. Um, but then I'm afraid, actually, at prep school, I started on all those wonderful Second World War books that we probably wouldn't read now, um, where eagles dare and that sort of yeah. thing, which, uh, which was which always a bit edgy, because I remember our headmaster used to censor, you, at the beginning of term, you'd have to show him what you brought back, and some of them had rather sort of fruity pictures on the front. A <laughs> bloke with a gun and a rather attractive girl. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, those, that, those, those gripped me through those, those years. And you've got what, hundreds of books now in France? I'm a terrible, I am, as you rightly observe, um, a terrible bibliophile. Uh, the French sort of element of this, we bought our house in France partly to free up some extra book space. <laughs> so several car loads came down full of books, only to discover that in our local market town there is an absolutely fantastic second-hand bookshop, wow. which of course, and so, mm -hmm. you know, I don't really enjoy shopping, so my wife says, right, you can, will you come, because you, and I'll let you go to the bookshop <laughs> afterwards, um, and you always find you come out with, uh, with more than you should. Um, and, and it's also terrible, so, I mean, I, I, there's a line, I think a quote from Antonio Fraser, who once said to me, you do realise that if you leave two books together on a shelf, they copulate and reproduce. <laughs> <laughs> there's always a bit of that, because, you know, yeah. you buy a book, that you think you your French is good enough to understand, and then you find it isn't, so you buy the translation and you wind up <laughs> multiplying your purchases. Mm -hmm. um, but so yeah, this uh, book then, what, one of the triggers wasn't it? Somebody mentioning having written your obituary. Can you tell us? Well, about it wasn't that? quite that. It was. I have a great and very old friend who, after a very successful career in the art market, then took up writing full time. But as a kind of side bar, he writes obituaries for a national newspaper. Yeah. And we were at, actually we were at the launch of a, of a mutual friend's book, and he said to me that he'd been asked by the newspaper in question to write our host's obituary. And then he added, he said, I, I offered to write yours too, but they told me you'd already been done. <laughs> <laughs> it, was quite, I mean, it was quite a complicated sort of yeah. reaction to that. I mean, obviously it's terribly flattering that somebody thinks it's worth doing, but... You know, 
do you do you worry about what's in it? I mean, given that you obviously are never going to read it, <laughs> and does it mean you've done everything interesting you could possibly do, or you know, could could I sort of can I do something specially <laughs> unexpected to get the obituaries editor to spend some money on a rewrite? Um, <laughs> but but I, 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 and I think the process of said motion is uh, all journalists really at heart are storytellers. Yeah. You know, you give us a collection of facts, whether it's about inflation or the royal family or people stuck in Sudan at the moment, and, and we like to sort of organise them uh, into a story that has some kind of meaning. And once I started thinking about my life, that's, you know, that sort of journalistic mm. instinct took over a bit. Um, there's another point, right, maybe it sounds a bit self-serving, I hope it doesn't, but, but having done a few history books, I've learned how incredibly valuable uh, memoirs are. Yeah. So for example, I did a book about the BBC during the Second World War, and the BBC written archives in Caversham are an absolute treasure trove, and also really good fun because they're not digitized. <laughs> so you ask for the file on censorship in June 1940, and it, it, you know, it just comes out just full of stuff, <laughs> and all sorts of unexpected treasures um, emerge from it. So the, 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 the sort of, the, the bones of the story are very well there, recorded. But I realise that it's only the memoirs and the diaries and things that really bring it alive and, you know, tell you what it felt like to be in Broadcasting House the night De Gaulle made his first yeah. appel, striding in with his big boots and his barking voice and so forth. So I sort of think we all ought to do this, actually. Um, even if it's only for our families. I think, I think just recording kind of day-to-day -day details of what life is like and, and particularly what you remember when you were young is just an incredibly valuable yeah. thing to do so you know get to it everyone because <laughs> you know your children I mean I think once children and future generations and future writers just will find that incredibly um sort of life enhancing really yeah or well, record your father and grandfather yeah um take out we've your recorded person. your grandfather we might have found out more about my father because we found out very bizarrely that my father witnessed your grandfather's wedding in Aden. Um, this is the book by the way. <laughs> this book here, Cruel Crossing, I didn't even make the link. This was a Waterstones book of the month that sold loads, which is Eddie's book about escape as well. And you may have heard the series. Promotion. <laughs> yeah, we like that. Um, you may have heard the series on uh, wireless. Um, so We'll get on to your amazing career and the, and the reporting in the BBC, I'm sure. But I just want to ask you about one theme in the book, which um, was unexpected to me, which is your faith. So, uh -huh. and forth, Catholicism. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me how that's sort of morphed and shifted a bit during your Well, life? I mean, the and forth element of the story is, is obviously now a very, very problematic um, one, I yeah. think is perhaps the polite way of seeing it. Um, I, th well, I was at and forth at a time when the school was immensely self-confident academically incredibly kind of vigorous um, and I loved it um, I made no sort of bones about that and we had some you know very remarkable people running it there was obviously Basil Hume uh, who went on to become Cardinal Hume and, and sort of enormously powerful religious voice on the national stage um, a rather wonderful uh, sort of slightly eccentric <coughs> headmaster uh, Father Patrick Barry about whom a story was told which is almost certainly apocryphal, but, but I'll tell it anyway. Um, it was alleged that at a meeting of the headmaster's conference, the headmaster of Eton said, um, at our school we prepare our boys for life, to which Father Patrick replied, at Amforth we prepare our boys for death. <laughs> um, but anyway, so, you know, they had all, all, that, all that going for it. Um, and then of course, years later, we discover that there was some pretty ugly stuff going on <clears throat> at the same time. And I did do quite a sort of painful exercise of going really reading the ICSA, the Independent uh, Commission on Child Abuse, report, um, and, and finding, well, Father Basil, uh, Basil Hume particularly, guilty of, not of abuse himself, but of, but of covering up. Yeah. And you suddenly find these people that you admired immensely had very much had feet of, of clay. And it was a funny incident, actually, which sort of set me off on, on going taking that backward uh, journey. Um, just after the Excel report was published, I was having dinner with two old school friends, one of whom is very successful in the city, and one of whom is a very distinguished public servant. And we said to each other, you know, we don't 
nonsense. It was a wonderful place. And then there was a pause in the conversation, and the distinguished public servant said, mind you, Father X did try to snog me and told me he loved me. <laughs> see, the funny thing is, you know, even after I left, um, I used to have to go to lunch with my wife and children and things. <laughs> and, you know, I'd known this guy for 50 years, and he'd never mentioned this. Yeah. And I think there was a sort of strange way in which we slightly suppressed or edited our own memories of the culture of the place. Mm. Um, I went back and looked at my diaries, and I find a few things in there which I've mentioned in the book, I won't go into details, but suggested that it wasn't quite as sort of cheerful a place as I remember it being. Um, but you but survived and you still go to Mass. I do still go to Mass, and, and, and I do think, I mean, one of the ironies of it is that we, we now judge the monks by the values they gave us. Yeah. Uh, but I still think those values were very powerful. I think the Benedictine tradition, um, what you learn about living in a community, which is what the Benedictine uh, sort of life is all about, um, <coughs> is very valuable. So I'm not going to say goodbye to all that. No. What were the but, two things? Sorry, carry on. No, it's just, it is just a, a very queasy making sensation to feel that your youth wasn't quite as you remember it. Yeah. Um, in the kind of ups. Yeah. But as you yeah. say, Francis has been a breath of fresh air in many ways, although not, it hasn't done enough. Pope. Well, he, he just, I mean, I, I, I call him in the book the report of Pope, <coughs> which is perhaps a little bit um, sort of glib, but I think the way that he um, starts with what he calls a culture of encounter, with meeting people and hearing their stories, and, and doesn't simply try and impose a bunch of rules, is yeah. just a very inspiring, and, and it, again, a sort of theme of the book, but that's sort of what I feel about my professional life, that in the course of reporting, I've learnt so much and continue to learn so much, which is an enormous privilege, um, and changed ways I thought. And I mean, it, it, encountering um, people all over the world is, is, a, is a great antidote to being certain or prejudiced or you know, taking a refuge mm -hmm. in, a, in a viewpoint. It's, it's, uh, so that's sort of my, my admiration for Francis is partly based yeah. on echoes I see of what it's like to be uh, a reporter. And you're still in, uh, you're still going even though you've been divorced and I think there's something else when you contributed to Why I'm a Catholic that you changed your view on. He really has read the book, hasn't he? <laughs> <laughs> so, but you, you've stuck with it. Well, I suppose the, the other thing was I was very lucky, actually. I did, I did a series for BBC Two about the modern Catholic Church. And it was in the 90s when we were, the BBC, I was, when I say we, was really rich and they had fantastic budgets. And we went to Brazil and El Salvador and the United States, uh, Africa, um, India, um, Sri Lanka, obviously Rome. I mean, we really did go all over the world, and, you, and it was a wonderful kind of discovery that whereas the Catholic Church in Europe thinks mostly about sex, in the rest of the world, actually, it doesn't think about that very much. It's much more engaged with really basic things like feeding people and, and you know, sort of political engagement and things right. that really matter to people. Yeah. So that was, rather, that was a kind of re-inspiring, I suppose, um, yeah. Catholic moment in a way. Yeah, I had some trouble getting the image out of my mind of the priest who advised during masturbation to put a rosary around your hand, but um, I'm sure that was frivolous <laughs> in part. So, your career, John Burke, can you tell us, tell everyone about the interview with John Burke? <laughs> you picked out all sort of most embarrassing moments. Uh, <laughs> no, it was, very, it was very good for me that, because um, when I left Cambridge, I thought, you know, as most people from Oxbridge do, I'll walk into some wonderful job. And I, I wrote to John Burt, um, using a complicated set of connections, who at the time was head of current affairs at London Weekend Television. And he, I said, I mean, I'm a bright young man, I'd like a job in telly. And he invited me along to an interview, although he didn't quite put it like that, he just said, you know, come and see me. Um, and I, I, it's funny, one of those occasions when you realise as soon as you walk into the room that you've got it wrong, because I was wearing a smart suit, because that's what my mum always told me, that you wore to interviews. <laughs> And John Burke was looking incredibly relaxed in a kind of pair of baggy cords and a roll neck sweater. Very smart, modern office overlooking the, overlooking the Thames. Um, and he started talking to me about the 
1980, this was 1979, as I was leaving university, 1980 presidential election, about which I knew nothing at all, <laughs> which very quickly became apparent and <laughs> after about 20 minutes. He stood up and he said, well, I could write you a polite note saying we have no vacancies, but frankly, it would be a waste of the postage stamp. It was, I think, probably not a great result. And, and actually, it was very good for me. It made me take things a bit more seriously and do a bit more swatting before mm, going so. to be interviews. And ITN, was it, do you think, would you describe it as a golden age, that the time at ITN? It sounds very exciting. It was, it was wild, I think is the mm. word, because, partly because we had loads of money. Um, in those days, there was only one commercial television station. Yeah. So advertisers poured money into the ITV coffers, and we were able to spend pretty much whatever we wanted. <coughs> and I still have a, a very vivid memory, which I, I unkindly tell junior journalists today as an example of what life was like before people got tough with expenses. But I, I was sent to um, Miami when there was a coup in Haiti, and the instruction was just get there however you can. And of course, unsurprisingly, because there was a coup and because they were they were quite literally stoning people to death in the streets, as we discovered when we got there, the airport was closed. So I rang the office and said, you know, bad news, the airport's closed. And the foreign editor said to me, hire a Learjet, but put it on your business card so that the expenses department doesn't notice for a while. <laughs> <laughs> Literally, I mean, what a way to go to your first coup, gliding over the Caribbean with a gin and tonic on the one hand. Um, so it, 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 was, it was good fun. Um, it was also, it had a sort of mad edge to it, and part of it was a kind of resentment between the two tribes, one of which was the, the generally Oxbridge graduate trainees, like Peter Sisson being yeah. a good, good example, and the kind of, the, the hard men who worked their way up via the, the school of, of hard knocks, if you like. They're most of them, you know, they come from the mail and the mirror and the sun and so forth. And they, when they could, enjoyed tormenting the Oxbridge types by sending them on the most ridiculous assignments they <laughs> could find. So there was one great day that I came into the office again wearing the suit as instructed by my mum, um, and the, the news editor shouted across the, oh you trainee, because we didn't have names, um, go to Brixton and find an escaped prisoner. <laughs> it one, of the, one of the red tops had run a story saying that the prisoners were nipping out at night. Every, so I potted down to Brixton and sort of, Spent the day sidling up to Ben in pubs. <laughs> in, your suit. in my suit. <laughs> That's your drink. I suppose by any chance you're an escaped prisoner. <laughs> That's the sort of thing. Anyway, but it, but it was quite good for us, I think, because it did it did take away any residual sort of I don't know ivory tower type thinking that you brought with you from university. And then um, the Anthony Blunt stakeout was tough. Wasn't that it? was another, another nasty one he's thrown me. Uh, but that was that was uh, that was. Yes, one of my first early mistakes. I was said, do you remember when uh, Anthony Blunt was revealed for yeah. being a Soviet spy? And it was a perfect story for ITN. So they sent, because, you know, spies, homosexuality, which in those days still had a kind of, it was, it was still, what people weren't happy about it quite. Um, and he, they said, so, right, we're going to flood London with camera crews. And the one place he's almost certainly not going to be is his own block of flats. Um, so we'll send a trainee there with a mute cameraman, and that was me. <laughs> and I thought that the cameraman would know what to do. I had no idea what to do. He thought that I would know what to do, because he was also quite new um, to the game. And I did all the sort of things that I imagined journalists did. I poked around the dustbins at the back of the floor. <laughs> I, I walked in, and the suit helped at this, on this occasion, and the doorman let me through the door, but he certainly wasn't going to let me anywhere near... Anthony Blood's flat. And eventually the cameraman said, I tell you what, look, we're clearly not going to find him here. So um, go around the corner and buy a half bottle of whiskey. And we'll sit here under this awning uh, and make sure that um, uh, and, and we don't get wet. And we'll just drink your bottle of whiskey. And we'll <coughs> put it down as coffees. And every so often, you, you, you ring the fire at your home desk and tell them that we haven't seen the thing. So we're sitting there quite merrily drinking our whiskey. When suddenly a car shot past. 
and somebody leant out the back and sort of did this at us. <laughs> um, <laughs> next day, headline in the Times, Blood Seed at London Flat. And it was Brian Sewell, do you remember him? Was, yeah. Yeah. And he, he, he said, we whisked him away from beneath the noses of two astonished journalists. <laughs> me. <laughs> so that was, that was another, another good, good lesson. I, I must get you to talk about Bosnia, because it's one of the most amazing sections. I mean, the war reporting and the overseas reporting are, are riveting. But you said there was a sort of freedom in Bosnia. Well, there's a, there's a whole... That's a, there's I mean, a, a horror, but the, no, no, no. the danger yeah. that you went to... And, uh, well, I think well, the one thing it's worth... There, there are two slightly separate things there. One is to do with the way um, war reporting has changed. Yeah. Uh, the first time I went anywhere dangerous, which was Beirut in about 1983, I guess. Um, You've got to tell the whole Hotel Commodore bed story. Sorry to be no, 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 no. <laughs> Well, I was, they, 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 before I went, they said, yeah. go, go to stores and see if they've got anything by way of protective clothing. So I went down to the cellar beneath ITM's headquarters in Well Street. Um, this bloke fished around a bit and uh, he found what looked to me like a thick vest. And he said, I used to have a list of what this thing would stop. But I've lost my list, and it'll be just my luck if whatever hits you isn't on it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the point is, there was no kind of preparation at all. You just got on a plane and went somewhere dangerous. Um, and now, before you went anywhere like that, you'd be sent on a training course, you'd be given a battlefield... Um, uh, first aid yeah. uh, training, you'd be you know, put through various scenarios and stuff. And, and us old, old war horses being forced to do this, we complain like mad, but actually, mm. I think it's a good thing. Uh, and I do, I'm, I'm very grateful for the battlefield first aid training because I know what I could, if, you know, if you've got a sucking chest wound, I'm your man. <laughs> um, I could deal with you. Um, so there was that, that kind of freedom, and it, it did. I mean, the Bosnian story, I'll tell the sort of the first bit of it, which is a bit of a shaggy uh, dog story, so do stop me if I... Um, uh, but I, I, was, I was actually newscasting one weekend at um, ITM, and at the time I was diplomatic editor, and, and up popped Martin Bell in Sarajevo on the BBC. Mm. Um, and in those early stages of the siege, it was thought very, very difficult to get in, and there was the competition scooping us. Mm. So the foreign editor said to me, because I was supposed to know about the abroad, as diplomatic editor said, well, what do we do? So I said, rather cheeky, I said, I'll tell you what, um, send two teams, one to Croatia and one to Bulgaria, and tell them to race each other overland to Bosnia, said I, cheerfully. He said, great idea. Just as I was leaving that night, he said, I don't suppose you'd like to be one of the teams. <laughs> and I didn't really feel I could say no, having suggested this. Um, it began as comedy, really, because we for some reason, had been booked into a hotel in Sofia, Bulgarian capital, which turned out to be a brothel. <laughs> and when we went down for dinner, as well as being given our um, menus, we were sort of presented with a lady dressed in Bulgarian peasant costume, who you know, was clearly not just a dinner companion. Um, <laughs> so we all, got, we all got slightly tiddly over dinner, because the whole thing had been so absurd. Um, except for we had a Serb fixer who... who, who was going to drive the car and he stayed completely sober and towards the end of the dinner I said well look we, there are no appointments here there's nothing we can do why don't we just get in the car and drive um and I, if you I don't know whether you've ever seen the television camera crew move but you've got these dozens of huge tin boxes wherever you go taking with all the equipment in it so all the tin boxes came down to reception in the back of the van and off we went drove through the night when we got to Belgrade I said, I think we ought to sleep for a little while. And we found a hotel. And just as we were checking in, um, I spotted a, a UN convoy passing on the road. And I said, there's only one place that can be going to, and that's Sarajevo. Let's follow it. So back went all the boxes into the van. <laughs> and we literally, we literally just drove and caught up with this convoy. And they weren't very pleased to see us, really, because that night we had to sleep in a field and... They came back and talked to us and so forth, but we just attached ourselves to them. And there was a bad moment on the journey when we crossed a, um, a checkpoint. And I was driving at the time, and I suddenly realised that the chicane that I was being made to drive through was made up of landmines on either side, which was not great. Um, 
That is the sort of thing you could never do now. I mean, quite right too, but I literally, on my own authority, let's go. Uh, anyway, miraculously, we did get into Sarajevo. And when all the boxes came out again, we found um, that one suitcase wasn't claimed by any member of the team. And we realised to our horror that when we'd swept up or rather drunkly all the boxes <laughs> up, we'd nicked someone's suitcase. And we opened it up and, and there was a card inside and he was a, a Macedonian citrus fruit grower. So he rigged up the, no mobiles in those days, the satellite television, and, and rather gingerly rang him up because obviously he might not have wanted his wife to know that he'd been staying in that particular <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, eventually we, we got it. We said to them, you know, the, the good news is we found your suitcase. The bad news is that it's in Sarajevo. <laughs> anyway, he eventually got it back and he very sweetly sent the foreign desk a crate of oranges to say thank you. <laughs> um, that's the shaggy dog story. Yeah, yeah. Um, really just to illustrate that, that we could take much more of our own initiative then. Um, mm than we, we could now. And I, I mean, of, of course it's right now that we're much more careful about it, um, but I rather miss that freedom and that thrill uh, of, of just sort of enterprise. And of course, one, and the other thing you realize, once you got there, and it really was, it really was a nasty shooting war, um, all the sort of constraints of normal life, like, you know, parking, permits or permission to interview someone, all that just drops away. Mm. You could you can do anything you like mm. as long as you, you know, are sure about the risks. Okay. Um, and, and it is a bit of a thrill that. Uh, but pretty traumatic, I imagine. Well it was no that was it was a very traumatic um, well it was traumatic for two reasons. I mean one personally because I've only ever got killed was travelling on a on a uh, road from the airport back to the main um, centre of town, which was a notoriously dangerous strip, and usually when you drove it, you sort of wove to give, you know, to avoid people shooting at you. But on this occasion, I was travelling right. We were travelling just behind a, a Canadian uh, armoured personnel carrier, which was very, very slow. So the sniper, who always tried it, had, tried his luck, had plenty of time to line up his shot, and he put the bullet through the back of the car, between my head and that of the cameraman, and out the front, between passenger on the, and the driver at the front of the car um, and I sort of felt the breath of it on the back of my neck so that was quite traumatic but a, a sort of allied to that was the fact that uh, that siege was conducted with fear being an absolutely deliberate um, weapon I mean they wanted to terrify the population um, and one of the things that one of the phenomena that was very striking is that people would get killed while they were out during the day by a sniper, but their family would have no idea what had happened to them. So there were quite a lot of just dead bodies mm. hanging about mm. the place. Uh, did this, um, so, uh, sorry, no, carry on. No, 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 I mean. I just wondered if this partly fueled you doing what you shouldn't have done in the Telegraph, <laughs> which was so I did. brave. No, that's and actually right. No, no, no. When I got back, I, I thought that the whole, that, that it, it was just unconscionable that what was essentially a medieval style siege yeah. should be conducted this way on, on the European continent in the late 20th century. So I guess I, I shouldn't, as an impartial journalist. So I did write a piece in the Telegraph arguing that we should take action, the British government should take action, which you're right, I should not have done. Um, but I don't regret, uh, as it happens, the British government did inside, indeed decide to interview six months later. But I think, um, I, I do think that unless you are able sometimes to get really angry about what you see, um, then it's not worth doing the job. I mean, you know, you, you can't, you shouldn't stay completely calm in yeah. the face of that kind of thing. So I don't regret doing it. It makes me a bit like Gary Lineker, doesn't it? What he did, yeah. Um, you're very insouciant about the danger and about this extraordinary KGB woman who more or less threatened to kill you, and about the whole BBC, uh, the Today programme, where you were, which everyone will know about probably. Yes, they're rather different levels. I mean, being fired from the day frame wasn't pleasant, but it wasn't quite the same as being shot yeah. at. But there's a St. Augustine quote about um, a very good not Augustine. having revenge, which I quite Well, he, yes, it's a great quote. I do. I've got it if you. No, no, I can. I can. can. <laughs> yeah. Stealing all my best lines. Yeah. 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 Sometimes um, I just forget what they've rotten. Yeah. Yeah. St. <laughs> Augustine famously, uh, along with his other wonderful quote about, Lord, make me good, but not yet. 
He is alleged to have said, feeling resentment is like drinking poison and hoping the other person will die. Mm -hmm. Which I found a very useful thing to remember when uh, I was going through my defenestration from the Today program. Yeah, how did um, the Mail get these stories? Because before they said Martin Bashir was going to replace you, didn't they? Oh, come on. There's a, I mean, I'm afraid journalists leak as much as politicians do, um, uh, particularly if they you know, want to achieve a particular end. I don't know who leaked the story that I was leaving today uh, or how it got out, but there it was. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and, and it... it, it Oddly enough, in, in a funny sort of way, it actually redounded to my advantage, really, because it meant I was I learnt this sort of upsetting fact about my future from a newspaper, um, and the BBC were rightly embarrassed that that had happened, which meant that in my negotiations with them, they were on the back foot. Mm. Uh, and also actually got me a huge amount of support from listeners, which was very touching. Uh, Jeremy Hunt and Keith Baz in the House of Commons? Indeed. A, a, a private, absolutely private member's bill was put down. <laughs> Much more important, though, was um, my wonderful children who organised a Facebook protest page, <laughs> which I mean, didn't work, but it was still, you know, really yeah. nice thing for, to, for them to have done. But you're still on the radio, and I just want to ask about the magic of radio, because I interviewed Annie Nightingale, and she said that there's something goes on when you're broadcasting that you can feel... It's such an intimate thing. You quote Marshall McLuhan yeah. saying it's warmer than TV. Well, and Annie Nightingale said the only other person she'd spoken to who agreed about this strange feeling was John Peel. That this is almost a. I, I think the t the, the, the um, contrast with TV is is quite uh, illuminating, really. I, I when I was a during my time as a BBC newscaster, um, I would find sometimes people would come up in the street and say really didn't like that tie you were wearing. <laughs> um, when I was presenting today, people would come up in the street and they'd want to engage with the ideas. They, you know, that interview it was really interesting. Or, or quite often, you got your grammar in a, you know, in a mess over this, that or the other. But it was about ideas, it wasn't about appearance. And I think that does reflect the very, as you say, intimate, warm relationship um, between presenter and, and audience, if, you, if you're doing it well. Because um, after all, you know, you, you listen when you're on the loo or in the bath or yeah. whatever it is. Um, and, and radio sort of penetrates at home and in relaxed circumstances in a way that, that does form a much closer bond. And I think actually when you are broadcasting on the radio, you need to imagine yourself um, almost in a one-to-one -one conversation, you know, chatting with somebody. Obviously that's a slight exaggeration because there are all sorts of kind of formal things and you've got to keep in your mind um, not being being um, not being biased, being sort of thoughtful and having the facts, but but it's still got that intimacy. Yeah. Um, I think. And when did you get up in the morning to do it? The today used to get up at three. Yeah. Which, do you know what, the funny thing is I mean, as long as, well, don't drink too much the night before. It's a very, I had one terrible experience when uh, we had a very old friend, actually John Snow, who had, was in Washington with years ago. And he'd come to dinner on a Sunday night. And because I knew I wasn't doing today on a Monday morning, I think the last sort of glass of Armagnac went down to about one in the morning. Um, and the phone went at 4.30 in the morning. Oh, oh God. And they said, uh, I won't say which of my then colleagues it was, but he's forgotten that he's doing program today and he's in France <laughs> could you do it <laughs> to which I replied I, I you know I wouldn't drive a car but, but if you want me to drive the nation's leading current affairs program I'll give it a go it was awful it was really unpleasant but uh, but as long as you didn't do that um, actually it's quite nice being driven through London at 3 40 in the morning with a pile of you know, it would be a pile of papers on the back seat looking as if they'd been armed by the BBC butler, sort of fresh papers. <laughs> and you could probably get through the headlines between home and getting into the studio. There's a tremendous sense of being sort of on top of the day and ahead of the curve. And in the middle uh, of politics. And, to and in the middle of politics, well, absolutely, yeah. And yeah. not crash the pips, it's called, isn't it? Crashing the pips is a mortal sin, <laughs> absolutely. And you can, if you're clever uh, and feeling malicious, you can make the person sitting next to you do exactly that. <laughs> <laughs> call, 
it's a question of when you stop talking and you watch the clock and you don't quite leave them enough mm -hmm. to get in the idea but they still got to say something um it's been a bit of sledging of that kind went yeah. on for quite i'm going to stop because i'm being selfish but is there one interview that really jumps out that you remember or one day of gosh well so many i suppose the one the one i recall in well actually a, a couple i mean well i'll, I'll tell you one because i've recorded quite a few in the book i think but one that sort of illustrates a particular challenge on the today program um, which is your relationship out of the studio with politicians um, because there is a danger if you become you don't want to be too standoffish and inevitably you're, you're moving in the same sort of world but if you become too friendly with them you can get into real trouble and this particular occasion was we, we my wife and i had spent um, a weekend staying with a Tory groundee and it was a lovely weekend a lot of extremely good wine was drunk <laughs> and it was in the days when Ian Duncan Smith was the leader of the party and um, late on Saturday night over a glass of port our host was expostulating on the dreadfulness of Duncan Smith's leadership uh, and he said frankly the time has come to send in the butler with the brandy and the revolver <laughs> Two days later, he was exposed in the Times as part of a plot to get rid of Duncan Smith. And he was duly sent on to the Today programme uh, to protest that this was entirely untrue, which he did. And I was the interviewer. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I, you, know, you couldn't really say, you lying toad. I <laughs> heard you two days ago in your cups, and I know you hate him. Um, so that, that's, a, that's an interview which illustrates one of the pitfalls or the dangers of today programme life. Well, there's so much more in the book. Um, I've got nowhere near asking what I wanted to ask, the meaning of boss well, we'll and the oh, death right, penalty. Okay. But um, yeah, we'll, we'll talk more on that. Perhaps we'll get you back to the paperback. Um, <laughs> are there any questions about anything? Yes. Um, being a journalist in the London scene, I mean, it's obviously sui generis and you must all get to know each other, blah, 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 and meet up at various uh, you know, annual awards and so on. <coughs> how do you, I mean, for example, how would Polly Toynbee get on with, say, Sarah Vine? <laughs> how do these people socially interconnect? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can. You don't have to. No, no, no. Talk I mean, about them specifically, but you get my drift. I do get your drift, and, and oddly enough, I think I, I can slightly dodge the question, because I think being from the BBC makes you, or indeed ITN. I mean, they, they too are impartial, but it makes you a slightly different kind of creature, because we don't come with any particular um, ideological baggage, which the two columnists that you mentioned very much do yeah so if we walk into a room i think um we can get on with most people and i can't think apart from well boris johnson i suppose i don't know what you know one or two people who might take against the bbc <laughs> sort of directly um but have you ever witnessed hostility between those sorts of people i don't i <laughs> no i mean I, I bump into polly sometimes jogging on platinum common uh and I've met Sarah Vine a few times, but I don't think I've ever actually had the pleasure of seeing them in the same room. I did, I mean, it's, it is funny though, um, how people who can be perfectly cordial to each other at an event like this or at a meeting at a party can be very rude about each other in print. Um, I once uh, was described in a blog written by a right-wing columnist from the Daily Mail as, um, a symptom of the moral degeneracy of modern Britain, <laughs> which I thought was a bit strong. Anyway, about two weeks later, I sat next to her at dinner. No mention of this. <laughs> 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 um, so, so you, it was nice being morally degenerate beside you. Beside I, 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 <laughs> um, I mean, I think there are some people who feel so strongly on ideological questions that they do find it difficult to pe talk to people. On well, apparently side. Dennis Canavan would, 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 in his time in the Commons, if he could avoid it, oh, yeah. he'd never yeah, yeah, speak yeah. to a Tory. No, that's true. But on the other, oh, well, for example, Charles Moore, um, former head of the Telegraph, great Brexiteer, 
Uh, he and I were at university together. He, I regard him as an extremely good friend. But he's an awful basher of the BBC. And we stay friends, because mm. um, I think some things go deeper than that sort of thing. Um, but you know, I suppose you, you, you read what he says about us, and uh, you'd think I couldn't be his friend for that. Mm. But you affected his view on the death penalty, which is nice, I think. Um, but I mustn't ask any more questions. Anyone else? The gentleman at the back. Yeah, I just wondered, um, uh, this is the benefit of your long career, so I just think about your book, but sort of just generally, um, do, you, do you have this sense of just the recent times of being off the scale of anything that's gone before? And I'm not talking about the pandemic in specific, particularly the pandemic, I'm talking mm -hmm. about, I suppose, Trump and the Crossbar Extension kind of. Yes, um, is the answer. Um, <laughs> well, I don't, I mean, I don't. extreme compared to your long career and the different things you've seen and changes? Well, I mean, I'm trying to think, when I, when I, when I started in journalism, Mrs. Thatcher had just been elected, and we went through some pretty, I mean, the minor strike, mm. you know, let's not forget that was a, that was a very, very bruising and incredibly divisive mm -hmm. uh, thing in British society, um, generally. The bright, I was in Brighton for the Brighton bomb. I mean, you know, people blowing up the prime ministers or trying to. Um, again, I think it, you, one, one can forget those kinds of things. Uh, do, you, do, do you agree on truth? Oh, well, I think that's a really important and in a way much bigger subject. Um, yes, the, the, that whole idea that truth is relative is kind of terrifying. Um, I suppose I'd like to think that it's one of the things that mean people still treasure the BBC because at a time when the media is so fragmented and when there are so many outlets and when people pick up stuff on Twitter and everywhere else that, as you say, may or may not be true and almost, again, as you say, suggests that truth doesn't really matter, I think the value of um, an, an outlet where facts are checked where running orders and agendas are edited by people who you know, have a long experience in doing that, and where people feel they really can rely on what they read or what they see or what they hear. Actually, in the long term, I think it greatly enhances uh, the value of the BBC because people you know, do turn to it at a time of uncertainty, and by and large, they believe what they, what they consume from it. Um, so, but, but, but I think, but you are absolutely right that that, that slight feeling of um, what, what's, what is objective truth and, and you know, what, what, what do people believe and that idea of my truth, uh, that, is a new, that is a very new ph phenomenon. Um, it, 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 I mean, it is partly to do with the fact that when I started, there were very um, few broadcasting outlets, as I said earlier, and people used to trust you know, there's only ITV, BBC Two, and BBC One, and the, the figures in those days for people's trust in News at Ten, for example, were astronomical. People didn't necessarily trust the papers, but in the polls, we always came out incredibly well. Um, and that, I suppose that was bound to change a bit with the fragmentation of the media. Mm. Um, but I, but I, 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 I'm, I'm not too de sort of depressed about it because I do think if we keep plugging away. Um, at, at objective, good objective journalism, balanced journalism, in the end that will sort of win through, I hope. <laughs> but time for a couple more. Well, just, just picking up on the um, um, truth and yeah. what is not truth, there seems to be this uh, splitting um, of with Ra in his resignation. He said one thing and yeah. refused to accept whereas on the other side there is this and also the split between what is bullying and what is not bullying for me bullying is just that you know it's the same as racism you can't start chopping it up into chunks and I think I'd love to see more influence with that within the straight papers sort of thing you, you, you know you can't mess about with this sort of thing you know the Diane Abbott thing sort of thing as well you know there seems to be relativism slipping in. Well, I mean, there was he clear, Rob, clearly make an effort to 
spin mm -hmm. a very different story. Mm -hmm. um, and I suppose that the most basic, it's our job to point out that an independent report found him guilty and he'd said he'd resign if, mm. if that happened, and he did. So, um, but Unwillingly. Sorry? I said unwillingly. unwillingly. No, absolutely. And he was yeah, given, yeah. was it two hours or something, to, to yeah. loose yeah. off before mm -hmm. it was made official and that sort of thing. So he had carte blanche from number 10 to kick off. Well, I, th I just I think that 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 kind of issue comes down to our willingness to be robust, mm. frankly, mm. Um, and and it isn't always easy. Mm. And you've always got you know you've always got the pressure of the fact that specialist journalists, including political journalists, need to stay close to their sources, otherwise they don't get the story. So, mm. and and there's sometimes quite a fine line between mm. you know getting information from the person at number ten and the person at number ten saying, "I'd like, you know, hang on a sec, let's let's tell the story our way." And that that goes on as normal. That goes on all the time. Um, um, reading Paul Moore, for example, was always saying, "I was speaking to a senior cabinet yeah. minister or an ex-minister, and you know, so you know, it's coming straight." Um, well, or crooked. It, it, well, it's <laughs> you'd like to think that they're talking truth to him. We no, just yeah. don't know. I suppose. No. Yeah, the gentleman behind has questions. Um, yeah, I'm just interested in the sort of amount of autonomy you had or whether it's changed over time when you're doing an interview and how much editorial pressure you get. Have you ever had situations where you've been stopped from taking a line of questioning that you personally would have wanted to? Not really. I mean, you. if it's a big interview, you will usually discuss it in some depth with your editor beforehand. Although... Quite often, actually, the logistics and the timing of things make that difficult. So, I mean, on the World at One, which I sometimes do now, everything's happening so late that you just haven't got time to go through an interview of any depth sometimes before you go on the air. Um, wonderful Brian Hanrahan, who some of you may remember, mm. you know, the famous <coughs> sports thing, he used to present the World at One occasionally. He compared it to diving into an empty swimming pool <laughs> and hoping the water's there by the time you hit the swimming pool. <laughs> you know, the scripts are still being written as you run into the studio. So there isn't actually much time sometimes to, to structure an interview. But if it's a big one on, I mean, today, um, Amal Rajan did Suella Braverman on the Today programme at 8 10. And they will have thought a good deal about that. He will have talked it through with the editor. And quite right, too. Um, but very often, actually, the, the best interviews happen when somebody says something unexpected. And I, I'm a great believer in the idea that what really matters in an interview is not your questions, it's listening to the answers. There's nothing worse than when you hear somebody ask a question and you can tell they're reading, just reading the next question mm -hmm. over there, off, off their notepad afterwards and completely missing you know, some great line that the uh, interviewee has dropped. Um, so, so listening and being willing to take the interview in a completely different direction is, is a really, really important factor. And you can't control, I mean, you can control a presenter a little bit when that happens, but given that most of us on radio for reasonable experience, editors tend to hang back. They might just say, okay, I think if you're really hammering someone, they might say, I think you've probably, you know, got where you want to on that one, move on, or something like that. But, it, you know, it's quite difficult. It comes in your ear when you're in the middle of a conversation. Mm -hmm. So a good, a good editor will sometimes surprise you and say, well, ask him this, mm -hmm. um, you know, because uh, they are listening as well. And that's really helpful. But they can't really say, stop it. I mean, <laughs> Uh, I tend to ignore them if they do. This lady has We seem to hear a lot at the BBC about journalists being cut and being redundant and news teams being amalgamated yeah. and so on. Whereas I presume the layers of management and bureaucracy increase. I mean, your thing though, what, 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 what do you feel? What, what do you think about that in the future? It's really difficult. I mean, the, the one thing in particular at the moment, of course, is the. the News Channel and the um, News Twenty Four being being joined together. Um, I, I'm not a BBC boss, so I don't. You know, it's not up to me to make the figures work. Um, I still think that the programmes I work on 
have the staff to do what we're supposed to do by and large. Mm -hmm. I won't say it's not tough um, and that some of them are incredibly hard, you know, work incredibly hard. But on a program like the one that one, I just think the team, you know, is, it, it, it can do that. It can do the job. That's so um, yeah, uh, uh, but it, it's it's such a huge thing the BBC. You know, mm -hmm. it's got so many outlets um, that it, it's very difficult to form a judgment on the you know the whole the whole thing. Uh, it's yeah. Uh, there was, uh, the, well, uh, this is completely sort of off the point, but a nice story about um, a great friend who was the controller of Radio Four. Uh, for a while, and, and before that, very senior in the in the World Service, and she decided to appoint a poet in residence for uh, the World Service, who was an Uzbek poet, and she announced this with great glee at a sort of management meeting, and she couldn't understand why all the faces sort of went completely sort of long, and everyone looked really shifty and upset. <laughs> and afterwards, she said, "What was the problem?" I said, "Well." We were about to axe the Uzbek service, and now you think the best is possible to do that. <laughs> and there's quite a lot of that sort of stuff at the BBC. It's such like a vast thing. Or, or, the, or the, the choirs, you know. Mm -hmm. They say um, they're going to cut. And, 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 then, and then, you know, quite rightly, lots of people say, but that's really precious, mm -hmm. and they change their mind. Mm -hmm. Is there a last question for we? Uh, this uh, gentleman here. Do you think there's too much information at the moment? And the standards of the information, news cabin. I don't think you can ever have too much information. Mm. I think it's a question of whether we succeeded, we succeed by and large in making sense out of it mm. and of um, giving you the bits of information that you really need. Mm. I mean, that sounds a bit as if we're sort of sinister mm. censors. I hope it's not true. I, 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 I'd like to think, though, we have the professional skills to curate mm. the information of it so that it actually is a help to you rather than people feeling completely overwhelmed. Mm. Well that was fantastic. We reached our allotted hour and we'd like to, to end.